good morning, everybody. I hope that you've had a wonderful week, and um, it's um, obviously a little cloudy, uh, dreary, rainy. We just <clears throat> can't seem to get that Easter Sunday resurrection morning yet, can we? That bright sun and that warm spring day. But um, as sure as God uh, brings life, spring is coming. I can guarantee you that. I appreciate Bonnie sharing with us about home missions. Uh, one of the areas of the home mission emphasis this year is collegiate ministries and um, churches beginning on campus. And here at Fairview, we've committed to that as well. We decided in our budget this year <clears throat> to offer uh, more support dollar-wise, and certainly we, we offer uh, volunteer-wise to them. It's the center, that's the Mary Washington campus ministry that uh, Gannon and Carrie Sims, two of our Baptist leaders, um, operate and minister in. And I got a very nice note from Carrie and Gannon that was on my desk this morning, thanking us for their support. But more importantly, let me know that a couple of weeks ago they had a worship service where they had 27 young adults make decisions for Christ and, uh, and or rededicate their life to Christ. So I want you to know that, you know, God, God is moving and we're a part of that. And uh, if you want to get more connected to what Gannon and Carrie's doing, call them. Or I know Valerie up in the balcony, she works with them a lot and uh, is on their board. So uh, we're, we're thankful for that. We need those praises and, and those, uh, those good those good prayer requests from time to time, don't we? So we're thankful for that. <clears throat> well, this, uh, this morning, we're going to begin a, a new sermon series, message series, because we are beginning now, uh, whether you know it or not, like I said, it doesn't feel like it outside, but we're beginning to march towards Easter. Easter's about seven Sundays away. Next Sunday, I believe, begins officially what we call Lent, the six Sundays preceding Easter. But we're going to have on Palm Sunday a great, um, our orchestra and choirs are going to sing a beautiful Easter musical. And so we want to talk about Easter. Some of us march towards Easter, and let's face it, where you are in life, some of you are limping towards Easter. You know, it may not be a, a great time of life, or you're limping spiritually towards you're looking for a boost, you're, you're looking for something to turn around in your spiritual life. Um, and so I'm going to be sharing with you on the disciplines of the disciple. In our church, this is the year of discipleship. And, and what I mean by that, in other words, what must every believer in Jesus be doing consistently to be growing into the likeness of our Lord. What does every one of us who believe in Jesus need to be doing consistently to grow to be more like him? Why are we looking at this? Because growing more in Jesus Christ means that we can bear more fruit for him, and that's what salvation in Scripture calls us to do. We are called to be saved. We're called to be forgiven from our sin. But after that, we are called to bear fruit for Christ in his kingdom. So as we begin this, this morning, let's begin with um, some questions from the heart, from your heart. You can answer these in your own mind, in your own heart, where you are with the Lord right now. First, are you, are you satisfied with your salvation experience with Jesus right now? Are you satisfied with your salvation experience with Christ right now, this moment? Maybe, or is knowing that you have eternal life through the forgiveness of your sins, you've asked Christ in your heart, is that enough for you? Are you ready to stop your journey right there? Are you ready to stop your Christian journey knowing you have eternal life? And that's what the Bible says. And so that's good enough for you. And you're going to wait to that day that you hope is far in the future. 
and you'll just go to heaven to be with him one day. Is that, is that where you are? Or in your spirit, and I think, I think the Holy Spirit puts this drive in us, do you want more than that? Do you really want to know Christ better? Do you sense that there's more to this salvation experience than, than just being saved for eternity? Paul says it like this in a prayer. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you know him better. In other words, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is continually giving us this spirit of wisdom and revelation that's encouraging us to know Jesus better. So where are you on the spectrum when I ask those questions? Or on the other side of questions, maybe you have this desire to know Christ more. Maybe do you want to really experience the power of Jesus and the resurrection? Do you want more than just eternal, the, the assurance of eternal life? Well, if you want to know Jesus more, if you want to experience the power of his resurrection, I want you to know that scripture says there is a path to do that. There is a path of discipline to help you grow in Jesus. Now, I said path and I said discipline. In other words, we have to work at it, don't we? And we're going to talk this morning about the first of those disciplines, the discipline that begins it all. You're not going to be able to carry out the other disciplines unless you have this one first. And the first of these disciplines is that Jesus says, and the New Testament says, you have to put Jesus Christ first in your life. You've got to allow Christ to be the Lord of your life. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, to discover a little bit more about that this morning, we're going to turn to a passage that, uh, of Jesus' words that at first are very shocking words of Jesus to us. And I think they were meant to be to wake us up, to wake disciples up. If you have your Bibles or you have it on your phone or you want, need one right in front of you in the pew, turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke, the 14th chapter. And we're going to look at some words of Jesus this morning about, about discipleship, about what we're talking about here about making Christ the Lord of our life and what exactly that means. The scripture starts there in Luke 14 and beginning with the 25th verse, it says this, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, large crowds were following Jesus. You know, large crowds still follow Jesus, don't they? There are millions and millions of Christians in our world. It uh, is one of the largest faiths in our world. But I would dare say that there are as many millions and millions that are committed and growing disciples of Jesus, wouldn't you? There's millions and millions of Christians. Are there millions and millions of growing disciples of Jesus? My intuition says no. And so Jesus turns to this same kind of crowd, this large crowd that's following him because he's of interest to them. He heals people. He teaches them great things. He, uh, he's something like nobody's ever seen, and they want to go hear him, see him. And Jesus knows that even though there's large crowds, there's many in this crowd that haven't really fully realized what it means to follow him day to day. And he turns to this crowd, and he teaches them what it's going to mean, what it's going to take to be a dedicated follower of him. 
And he does this, he begins with a very startling, stop you in your tracks statement, doesn't he? What's he say about the one that really needs to follow him, make him Lord of their life? He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoa. <clears throat> On the surface, that sounds kind of radical, doesn't it? That sounds kind of, how in the world am I going to do that, doesn't it? That almost sounds like, that doesn't sound like Jesus. It's almost like, well, what if you went to see a, uh, your favorite politician, whoever that is, if there's one such out there now, <laughs> and at this politician's rally, they, they stood up, he or she stood up, and they talked about everything you believed in politically. I mean, you were with this person. You wanted this person to succeed. You thought this person had the answers politically for your community, your country. And then at the end of the speech, they said something like this. Now, people, we can get this done. We can get there, but I want to tell you, getting there is going to be tough. And I want you to vote for me, but I'm also going to need every one of you who vote for me to sell out. Now, during this campaign and during the years that I'm serving, you may lose your homes. You may lose your family. You may be separated from them. Your income may go down, way down. But in the end, it's all going to be better. And then he says, okay, who's with me? Just what happened here. I think it'd be dead silence. There'd be shock. <laughs> They'd be saying, whoa, what are you talking about? And I think they'd be so stoned that, that no one would shout out at that person in anger. Nobody would throw rotten tomatoes. They probably would just stare at this guy with the dumb stare saying, are you crazy? And it, when we first read this verse of Jesus, I think that is what we do when it appears what Jesus is saying is that we've got to give up family to follow you. But Jesus isn't asking us to hate our families. He's not asking us to leave our families. He's not even asking us to give up all of our possessions. What he is reminding us in a very extreme example is that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, must become the number one priority in our life. Yes, even more than we love our family. That's tough, but that's true. Even more than we love our possessions, even more than we love maybe our job. Jesus says it more like this. Here's another example, um, a secular example, way to look at what Jesus is saying. I love watching. I get hooked on it when it comes on or, or when I just want to watch it again. For some reason, I love watching Band of Brothers. Has anybody, y'all seen Band of Brothers? Oh, isn't that a great one, you know? And uh, the Band of Brothers is about the 101st Airborne Division that parachuted on D-Day behind the German lines, and it follows this company of soldiers <clears throat> throughout the rest of World War II. And there's this powerful scene in one of the first episodes of the series of the soldiers flying on the plane, all in their jumpsuit and parachutes, uh, getting ready in a few hours to jump into that mayhem, into that combat. And it, they're very quiet. They're, they're very reflective. And... Uh, we know that these soldiers were willing, they had decided they were willing to sacrifice their lives, years with their families, and their own dreams for the sake of freedom. 
and for the sake of a cause that they believed in. That's what Jesus is saying. That's more, that's more of what the way that this should come across. Not that we're willing um, to lose our families, but we believe in the cross of Jesus. We believe in what Jesus has done for us. We believe in the love of God is stronger than anything, and we're willing to give up everything for that. And the spiritual fact is, is that you cannot be an effective disciple unless you're willing to make Christ the number one priority in your life. In other words, there is a big difference in Jesus being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord. There's a difference in that, isn't it? Jesus will be your Savior if you ask him in your heart. He wants to be your Lord, but you're going to have to do something about it. It's going to take discipline to do that. But Lordship... Making Christ Lord of our life is where the victory and the kingdom work really begins. That's where we talk about where Paul says we can know the power of the resurrection in our life and what we experience. And so that's why Jesus goes on to say in verse 27, the next part, he says, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. To Jesus' followers, when he says you're not willing to carry your cross, that wasn't a figure of speech to them, was it? That was reality. As first century Jews, they had watched people, neighbors, maybe even family, made to carry their own cross and be crucified by Rome. To us, it's, you know, we, we have that sense of figure of speech that, yeah, that's a powerful symbol. To them, it was reality. Jesus says to them and to us, following him all the way, it may, it may cost you your life. It's like those soldiers on the plane, but it's certainly going to cost you living life just like you want it. Because following Jesus might mean your priorities in life will change. Your habits might change. Your circle of friends might change. Your ethics might change. Because you're going to be changed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Not this culture, not this world, not this country. But you know, as we begin this, doesn't that kind of living for Jesus sound exciting? Isn't that adventurous? Isn't that what many of you really want in your life? Don't you want that power? Don't you want that excitement? Don't you want that nearness to the Lord? But wait a minute, Jesus says. Just know that before you jump in, I want you to count the cost. The way to freedom of spirit and the power of the resurrection is not easy. Count the cost. See what it's going to be. And that's why he goes on to say, he gives a couple of examples, doesn't he? Beginning with verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first, stand, first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay down the foundation or are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person begins to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off 
and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. This road that we want to jump in on is not going to come easy. It's going to take work. It's, it's going to take calculation. It's going to take planning. It's going to take discipline. But what great goals in life don't require these things? But the crowds and the rewards or the rewards of this discipline life are great. They're rewarding. Great victories await you. Experiencing the miracles of God can be on the horizon, but you got to sell out. You must give up everything to do it. It's an old illustration of uh, there was a preacher over in England. He was uh, preaching a revival sermon, and in that sermon he said, it remains to be seen what God will do with the person who gives themselves up wholly to him. And during the invitation time, a young man named D.L. Moody responded and told that preacher, I will be that man. He gave himself wholly to God. And I don't know if you know the story of D.L. Moody. But D.L. Moody, with no more than a third grade education throughout his life, led hundreds of thousands of people in England and the United States to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. But it began with him saying, I'll be that man. I'll be that person. I'll give my life wholly to God. I knew on a maybe a realm we can understand. I think I told you this before. I don't remember his name. But uh, I just remember him as the potato chip man. And uh, back when I was at the board years ago, the mission board, uh, we were in these small groups at a, at a big conference, and we were talking about how God had changed us and, and about um, this, about making Christ Lord of our life. And the potato chip man was there, and he said, this is the first one of these I've made it to. But he said, I'm a newly committed Christian. And he said, I want you to know that I, I was saved a long time ago, but up till about a few months ago, I had not lived my life for Christ. He said, uh, I was working all hours. When I, most of the time when I got home, I was just not present. Uh, when I had spare time, I was out with my buddies doing what I wanted to. And he said, uh, one day uh, I realized my wife came and said, you know, our marriage is in trouble. In fact, I, I'm, you know, we're, we're not really married anymore. I'm ready to give this up. And he said he went to church with her, and in the service, he felt the urge, the need. He said, I've got to change, and he rededicated his life. He said, I gave my life wholly to Jesus, not as my Savior. I made him my Lord. And he was at this conference because he had already made two or three overseas mission trips for God. And he said, now, he said, maybe I'm overcommitted, but they got me in the choir you know, I'm, I'm serving God at church. I'm, I'm involved in missions. He said, uh, my, uh, my marriage is strong again. My wife and I are together, pray together. We grow in Christ together. And the thing is, the whole time he's telling this story, he's just sobbing. I mean, he can't hardly get these words out. Tears and, and uh, liquids coming from everywhere. <laughs> one of those sobs eyes, nose, mouth I mean, he is just sobbing because Jesus had changed his life there's a difference there's power in Jesus becoming our Lord isn't it so the challenge from scripture today is will you accept Jesus' challenge to not be just a, crowd, a casual crowd follower, but to make him Lord, number one, in your life. And the challenge is, will you join me on this Lenten journey, this march or limp towards Easter, to discover 
the disciplines, the other disciplines necessary to make this lordship happen. We're going to talk about them every Sunday. If you need any other ultimate motivation this morning to make Christ of your life, I think we discover that motivation every month when we take communion together. How much more motivation do we need than what the bread and the cup represent that, that it reminds us that Jesus gave his all for us? That he gave up his body. That he died on the cross, a perfect man, a perfect God. That our sins can be forgiven and we can have his power, God's power through the Holy Spirit in us all the time. We're reminded of the cost it took for Jesus to be Savior of the world. And he demands for us, cost from us, doesn't he? Nothing comes cheap. Anything worth having takes discipline. So in just a minute, I'm going to have a prayer for us, and I'm going to invite us all to come up and remember. To remember by uh, taking the bread and the cup, at this service, we do it by what's called intinction. <laughs> you can take a, you'll be given a piece of the bread, which is the, represents the body of Jesus Christ and what he went through sacrificially for you. And you can dip it into the juice, which represents Christ's blood, the ultimate sacrifice that he took and partake of it. You can come to this station or this station and, uh, and take communion together with us. Uh, but remember this morning about communion. Remember the motivation it gives you of what Christ did for you and what he's asking that you give to him. Let's pray together, and then we'll share communion together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word and uh, all that you did for us on the cross. You're our Savior. Lord, you ask us to follow you deeply and fully. Show us and remind us of why you're in communion and show us your power this day and throughout this week and the rest of our life as we try to give it totally to you. And when we mess up, Lord, forgive us, for we are but men and women. We come to you now in communion in Jesus' name. Amen.